Thank you very much, uh, Holger. I'm going to address uh, some of the policy issues uh, uh, here uh, around the macroeconomic um, area. First of all, just to say what macroeconomic um, management <coughs> is, it's those good things of taxing and spending, it's public debt, it's exchange rate policy, it's monetary policy, all the things that um, governments have to grapple with. All the things, of course, that governments in Europe do terribly well. Now, the growth and employment effects of, of aid do, to a degree, depend upon the macroeconomic policy framework within which aid is used. And uh, we at WIDA, through the RECOM program, are doing quite a lot of work on this. We had a conference in Nairobi uh, in December. Certainly, whether we can scale up aid, whether we can increase aid dramatically, does depend upon whether aid sits in a good macroeconomic framework. If a country is not taxing and spending effectively, it can't use aid very effectively. Uh, a great deal of criticism of aid uh, alleges that aid has uh, a negative macroeconomic effects, uh, some of which we've uh, discussed already. Uh, but also, one, one uh, reason why we need to think about the macroeconomics of aid is uh, that uh, these countries get other financial flows. And uh, these financial flows are becoming increasingly important. Uh, particularly uh, natural resource uh, revenues, and donors are clearly interested in how they can best uh, help countries uh, that are getting, for example, uh, new oil revenues and all of the issues that come with that. Uh, and so the, back, the bigger macroeconomic picture around aid is actually changing. It's quite changing quite dramatically from what it was 30 years ago, certainly, uh, to even uh, 10 years ago. That's simply a graph showing you how important uh, natural resource revenues have become relative to aid. They dip in 2009 because of the global recession, but then if you look at the more recent data, you'll see that they're, they're back up. So countries like Kenya, uh, Tanzania, Mozambique, Mozambique was a large uh, discovery of natural gas uh, uh, announced uh, last week, another one. Uh, these are receiving increasing flows uh, from the resource sector, and that's a new context within which aid has got to work. Still, these countries have quite low revenues. Uh, revenues in Africa are, are, are below average. Uh, uh, Low-income countries have low revenues. There has been some success, partly supported by donors, in raising uh, domestic revenue mobilization. But until these countries grow, and they grow their tax base, so it's quite difficult for them to increase their spending on all the good things that we want to see uh, in development. So, <clears throat> we have seen progress in macroeconomic management. Uh, countries are now uh, less reliant on aid. There's more uh, uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, there's more issue of, of sovereign uh, public debt, which is attractive. Uh, public spending programs and frameworks have improved in many countries, again through uh, technical assistance. Uh, ministries of finance and central banks are certainly better uh, in Africa uh, than they were. <coughs> Uh, I started my career 30 years ago in Tanzania amidst the, uh, the crisis of the early 80s, and uh, certainly many of us who've worked on Africa have seen a great improvement in the quality of policy making uh, in the region, which is a tribute, obviously, to African policy makers themselves, but there has been a large amount of technical assistance that has gone into that. And so countries are now becoming less aid dependent. If you look at a country like Uganda, uh, the oil that's now coming on stream will add um, significantly to the public revenues. Uh, Ghana now receives as much in uh, foreign direct investment as a proportion of GDP as it does in aid. The sovereign debt of uh, Ghana is a very attractive investment. It's now backed by oil revenues, certainly a much more attractive um, uh, investment for your pension fund uh, than much of the, uh, the debt of uh, Mediterranean Europe. And so the macroeconomic prospects of these countries are, are looking um, you know, much better than they were. What are we going to see in aid dependence? We're actually going to see a lot of countries shift down that curve to become less aid dependent. Finn mentioned the graduation from IDA, for example, of India uh, shortly. But on the other hand, we're going to be stuck with some very hard cases at the top end. The smaller and poorer countries, uh, the fragile states, and so forth. So what are our challenges? Well, in the countries that are doing relatively well, for example, the Ghanas, uh, we really need um, aid to focus more on um, helping those countries get more out of the resource boom that they're experiencing. Uh, 
uh, we need to help them uh, achieve much more structural transformation because although they're moving up to middle income status, uh, to a degree uh, their economies are still relatively undiversified. I uh, personally think that uh, obviously uh, Botswana is a success story. Botswana to a degree is a success story for aid in its early years. One of the great lessons of Botswana is having a very carefully articulated national plan for using your um, resource boom, and in Botswana's case it's diamond, or for using your aid uh, resources. So I think we need to think much more about effective national plans. Uh, I think uh, donors will want to step up their uh, dialogue with society parliamentarians on the use of, uh, of uh, natural resource revenues and aid within the macroeconomic framework. Some donors may well wish to retain uh, budget support, even to countries that are now receiving quite large uh, oil revenues, uh, simply to maintain a place at the table in the discussion around the macroeconomic framework. And I think you'd actually, when you talk to some of the technocrats in the ministries of finance and central banks in the, those countries, they'd actually quite welcome the continuation of some budget support, because of course, you know, they're having to head off on a fairly daily basis uh, politicians who wish to spend oil bonanzas on, you know, palaces and pyramids and all those things that politicians uh, wish to spend them on. So, you know. Uh, the resource envelope for these countries is getting a, a great deal better, uh, but we all know the risks of, of large um, oil discoveries. As I mentioned, the tougher cases are the small and poor, uh, the Malawis, etc., uh, the conflict afflicted, which uh, we, we've uh, talked about earlier. But still, when we look at fragile states, I always think of Bangladesh, which had many things going against it, but which has been, uh, in some ways, uh, quite a success story over the last 30 years, including for some of the aid that's gone into that country into, into infrastructure. Just to say a little bit about the real economy of aid, uh, from what you'll have got from the previous presentations, we think the, the balance of evidence um, shows that aid uh, has generally had a, a positive, although sometimes mo uh, modest, uh, impact in uh, promoting economic growth. Uh, aid, of course, uh, is a large uh, increase in demand uh, in an economy. The flow of resources in the economy adds to demand. Whether the supply side of the economy can respond uh, is often very differentiated. For example, uh, you could think of a large farmer versus a small farmer in their capacity to expand their supply in response to the kind of rise in aggregate demand that aid brings. But of course, aid is about much more than raising aggregate demand in the economy. It's about infrastructure investment. It's about reducing the remoteness of remote regions. It's about strengthening institutions. And it's about helping to prevent conflict, which is all, in essence, um, improving, the, improving the supply side of the economy. I should say in passing here that while we think growth is extraordinarily important, partly because it raises the tax base and allows you to spend more on the, on the good things that you want to for development, what's also important in these countries, and this is where the structural transformation side of aid comes in, is actually reducing the variance of growth, the fluctuation of growth um, as it goes through time. So, for example, if we compare two countries, this shows the variance of growth in Equatorial Guinea, uh, which is an oil-dependent uh, economy, and uh, Vietnam. Both have had actually similar growth rates, but they have very different structures of economy. What Vietnam has been able to do is to structurally transform that economy so it has many more sources of growth than, say, agriculture, which means that its growth is less volatile over time. Whereas the problem with the oil producers, of course, is that they, main, they remain very dependent upon a single source of revenue, and therefore their growth is very volatile. So one of the tasks is not only to raise economic growth, it's also to reduce the volatility of growth. And as we know in Vietnam, the donors have had some success in supporting the Vietnamese government to do that. On the supply side, as we've already mentioned, uh, the, some of the effects that you have uh, from aid on the supply side are rapid. Uh, for example, you, know, you can rebuild a bridge in a war-destroyed economy within a year or two, but transforming education and then getting the benefits from education is a much more uh, longer-term uh, process. Uh, that, of course, has implications for how we allocate aid. Uh, aid, of course, at the moment is, is very much uh, driven towards the social sectors, particularly in the light of the MDGs. 
But it also reflects some difficulties we have in the aid community about thinking through project selection and the kinds of projects that most benefit uh, growth. Some have argued for a greater emphasis on infrastructure, spending and perhaps more investment in the productive sectors in the allocation of aid. That's something we might want to talk about um, after the, the break. The issue of Dutch disease rears its head uh, very often in the literature. I, I don't know why, well I do know why actually, that the, uh, such a charming people as the Dutch are associated with, the, with having a disease called after them. Maybe we should have um, called it the British disease because we've been far less successful actually in managing our oil as compared to the Dutch with natural gas. But you'll be familiar with the, the sad tale of Nigeria, where basically Nigeria pretty much destroyed its real economy, particularly its agricultural uh, sector, when it discovered oil, increased oil in the 1970s. Many people in their criticism of aid have, have, have alleged that um, aid is having uh, those Dutch disease effects as well. But we've seen from the cross-section and time series evidence that that seems actually unlikely. And one reason it's unlikely is that aid is about improving institutions and infrastructure and the supply side, whereas unfortunately oil is often about building the pyramids and the palaces and has uh, led to uh, very little structural transformation uh, of those economies. So we really have to think very carefully about the kinds of resource uh, inflows countries are getting and the ways that they use them. And certainly the task for aid in the new oil producers of Africa is to help them use those resources much better. So, a good performance in terms of exports. It's a rather undiversified um, export base. What do we conclude from this? Well, I think we can conclude, particularly for people like me who have been, um, and others obviously in the audience, who have been in, in this business a fairly long time, that we have seen an improvement in macroeconomic management uh, since the 80s and the 90s. I remember participating in a number of World Bank missions in the 80s and the 90s, um, where the situations in many countries were extraordinarily dire. Uh, the IMF and the World Bank themselves learned a lot about that experience, about thinking much more about the supply side uh, of the economies. We're seeing that growth is raising public revenues, um, but we need to ensure that those are well invested. The taxing and spending has to be right. The debt management has to be right. Those good things that you do in macroeconomic policy have to be right. There's a lot of scope for technical assistance there by the donor community. And we're seeing success in graduation through the process of economic growth, Ghana and other countries moving up to low middle income status. Uh, but we need really uh, to think hard about what we're doing about the fragile states, where certainly one aspect of fragility is they have much less um, ability and capacity to manage the macroeconomics of development. In that sense, in some ways, wider as a UN institution would always assert that peace building is good economics. It provides the background for effective deployment of economic policy and management. And as a last point, I think... Um, we can expect these countries to do a lot, but at the end of the day, many of them remain very small in terms of economic size and really very vulnerable to the fortunes of the global economy. And at the moment, uh, you could certainly say that the uh, system of international monetary governance, the system of global economic management, is not encouraging for poor countries. It never really has been, uh, but it is extraordinarily weak. Many central bank governors, for example, have built up very large um, foreign exchange reserves, partly using aid, because they're just waiting for the next big shock to come. Um, and those big shocks will come. So, you know, my story is a story of progress. It's a story of improvement. Uh, but these things are extraordinarily fragile, both at the country level and at the global level. So.